Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the lectin complement pathway. Okay, so, so far what we've seen is that uh, what will happen is that when an inflammatory exudate is formed, it will bring in mannose binding lectin complexes and uh, complement proteins to the interstitial fluid where the microbes are invading. Okay, then what will happen is that the mannose binding lectin complexes, which remember are these complexes of six mannose binding lectin proteins and two mannose binding lectin associated serine protease 2 proteins, and finally two uh, mannose binding lectin associated serine protease 1 proteins, these will bind to the uh, terminal mannose and glucose monosaccharides on the ends of polysaccharides at and uh, oligosaccharides, which are within glycoproteins, on the surface of the microbe. Okay, that will then cause the activation of this mannose binding lectin complex, and it will start converting the two complement proteins, C2 and C4, uh, into C2A and C2B, and C4B and C4A. And remember, we're calling the big subunit of C2, uh, we're calling that C2A. What will then happen is that C4B will bind to glycoproteins on the surface of the microbe, and then C2A will bind on top of that to form a C4B2A complex, which will then start breaking down C3 into C3B and C3A. We've discussed that C3B then binds onto glycoproteins on the surface of the microbe, and will lead to those microbes being more tasty to phagocytes, and will a result in the microbe being more likely to be phagocytosed. Okay, now, before looking at the other function of C3B, let's turn our attention to this C3A molecule here. So, C3A is going to diffuse off, and basically it's going to act on a type of cell that you have all over your body. Okay, so it's, this cell type is stationed all over the body, and it's known as a mast cell. Okay, now mast cells are absolutely full of granules, and this isn't a granule, this is the nucleus of the mast cell, but they're full of these granules, or vesicles, uh, which are ready to be exocytosed when the mast cell receives uh, a signal to exocytose uh, the granules. And the granules are absolutely full with a, a molecule known as histamine, which is a very powerful pro-inflammatory mediator. Okay, so these are full with histamine. Okay, so histamine is capable of causing type 1 activation of endothelial cells. So if a mast cell degranulates, and that's a good key word, so the process of degranulation or mast cell degranulation is when mast cells exocytose uh, their granules which are full of histamine. Okay, if they do degranulate, then the histamine will be released into the interstitial fluid. It will go and find blood vessels, so arterioles, capillaries, and venules in the area, and it will act on the endothelial cells of those blood vessels, and it will lead to type 1 activation. Okay, so type 1 activation does three main things. Firstly, it causes vasodilatation of the arterioles, okay, leading to increased blood flow to that area. Secondly, it causes increased permeability of the capillaries and the venules, leading to the formation of more inflammatory exudate, okay? And finally, it also causes uh, the activation of the recruitment of leukocytes, specifically of these neutrophils, uh, which are one of these major types of phagocytes. So it helps in the extravasation of neutrophils. It will lead to the endothelial cells uh, putting certain molecules on their apical surface, which are going to start grabbing neutrophils, and then they'll move the neutrophils between the endothelial cells and into the interstitial fluid to fight the microbe. Okay, so histamine is going to go off and trigger, as I say, type 1 activation of endothelial cells. Okay, right. So, C3A is one of these signals that triggers mast cell degranulation. So there is a receptor on the surface of mast cells known as the C3A receptor. So this is 
the C3A receptor. And when C3A binds to the C3A receptor, it's going to cause mast cell degranulation, histamine will be released, and it will lead to type 1 activation of the endothelial cells of the blood vessels in that area. Now, C3A is very much so, and was realised long ago to be very much so, involved in a process known as anaphylactic shock, or in a disease process known as anaphylactic shock, which is a rather terrifying name for a rather terrifying disease uh, process. Okay, so anaphylactic shock. Now, anaphylactic shock is basically what's so dangerous about an allergic reaction. Okay, so if you, for instance, eat something that you are extremely allergic to, then the molecule potentially that you're extremely allergic to can go into your bloodstream and it can cause widespread mast cell degranulation. So it can cause, you know, the, the molecule can get disseminated all over the blood, uh, all over the body and it will cause degranulation of mast cells everywhere in the body. So you'll be getting type 1 activation of endothelial cells all over the body. Now what does type 1 activation lead to? Well we just discussed this, it leads to vasodilatation of the arterioles, increased vascular permeability of the venules and capillaries, and leukocyte recruitment. Now we're not too worried about leukocyte recruitment, but if you're getting vasodilatation of arterioles everywhere, and you're also getting blood vessels becoming leaky everywhere, then you're going to get blood Move, moving out of the bloodstream and going into the interstitial fluid all over the body. So basically you're going to get swelling all over the body and your blood volume is just going to go down and down and down and down. And shock, whenever anything has shock uh, behind it, it basically means cardiovascular failure cardiovascular collapse, whichever terrifying uh, terminology you want to use. It basically means that the cardiovascular system is now no longer capable of actually doing what it's supposed to do, which is delivering nutrients, oxygen and glucose to tissues and removing waste products such as carbon dioxide from the tissues. Okay, and in anaphylactic shock, it's simply because the blood volume has gone so low that it's no longer capable of actually doing that anymore. It's so the body. It's a life-threatening disease, basic it, disease process. I don't know if you'd describe it as a disease. A disease process is what you'd describe it as. It's a life-threatening disease process, and it's extremely difficult to deal with, basically. Okay, uh, so C3A was found to be involved in anaphylactic shock, so it was named an anaphylatoxin, okay, so an anaphylatoxin, right, because of its involvement in anaphylactic shock. Right, okay, so allergic reactions can be extremely serious, and they can lead to anaphylactic shock in the most extreme cases. Okay, so C3A activates the C3A receptor on the mast cells and causes mast cell degranulation. Now, let's look at the final role of C3B then now. Because C3B, we've already seen that it's involved in this opsonization of the microbe, but it's actually also got another role. So basically, C3B combines to another complement protein, C5. And for this, I'm going to go on to another piece of paper here. Okay, so let's just um, write out some of the essential things that we need to transfer from our previous piece of paper onto here. So, essential, it's going to be that we have the glycoprotein still here. So let me get my colours. So we're going to need this C4BC2A complex. We haven't finished with that yet, so I'm going to redraw this out here. Okay, so here, remember, is this glycoprotein on the surface of our microbe. So this represents the cell membrane of our microbe. And then bound to the glycoprotein is our C4B protein, which has then got C2A bound on top of it. Okay, so this is C4B, and then bound on top of the C4A is a C2A, sorry, C4B uh, is the C2A protein. Okay, so we had C4B in purple here, and then we had C2A in orange. Okay, 
and this complex was involved in breaking the C3 protein down into C3A and C3B. Now it's going to have another function. So what's going to happen is that the C3B, okay, here, is going to bind to another complement protein known as C5. Okay, so here is this other complement protein known as C5. Right, so C3B we had shown in red, okay, and now the new guy here is going to be C5. Okay, so this is the other function of C3B. It can bind to C5, or it can do that other thing where it bound to the glycoprotein, but we're finished with that now. So we're looking now at its involvement with C5. So it can bind to C5, and it can cause a conformational change of C5 that then allows C5 to be acted upon by this enzyme complex here, this C4B2A complex here. And what this complex is going to do is it's going to break down C5 into a big fragment, C5B, and a small fragment, C5A. Okay, so here is the big fragment, the C5B, and here is the small fragment, the C5A. Okay, and once it's broken C5 down into two separate portions, the C3B will then break off, okay? So you regenerate the C3B. This can then go off and bind to more C5, or it could bind to a glycoprotein on the surface of the microbe and then opsonize the microbe. Okay, so here's our C3B, and we've now got these two separate fragments, C3B and C... sorry, C5B, and C5A. Now, C5A is another anaphylatoxin. Okay, so this is another anaphylatoxin, and it can also go off and activate mast cells. So if I draw a mast cell again, here is a mast cell, okay, with its nucleus here, and its vesicles full of histamine here, or its granules as they're often referred to as. Okay, so I'll put some turquoise, dot, turquoise dots in there to denote the histamine. Okay, right. So, on the surface of the mast cell, just like there was a C3A receptor, there is also a C5A receptor. So this is a C5A receptor. And basically, C5A can then go and bind to the C5A receptor on the surface of the mast cell and trigger mast cell degranulation. I can trigger the mast cell to release the granules containing histamine. Okay, so the mast cell will release loads of histamine into the interstitial fluid. The histamine will then go and act on the endothelial cells of the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules in the local area and cause um, a type 1 activation. Okay, right. Now what does C5B do? Well, basically, C5B is going to start associating with other complement proteins, okay? And we'll continue this discussion, and we'll see how it's going to be involved in forming something known as the membrane attack complex in the next video.